Hello, uh, welcome to IWSS 2020. I'm Janakata Surya. Uh, my uh, title of the presentation is Astrosesimology of Delta School Stars. So I'm working as a research scientist at the Astronomy Division of the Clark Institute of Sri Lanka. So let me uh, proceed my presentation. So this is the uh, overview of my presentation. So I would like to discuss about the brief uh, introduction about astrosesimology. What is astrosesimology? Just to give some idea about what is that. And uh, so uh, this astrosesimology can be applied to different type of stars. But I uh, just select about uh, delta scruti type stars. Uh, this is a particular type of variable stars, so I'm focusing on that. So just give some idea about what is delta scuti star, and then uh, uh, so determination of pulsation frequencies. So this is based on the, the pulsation or the oscillation of stars. So I will explain about how do you find out the pulsation frequencies and a case study. So that means uh, one example. I will uh, show you uh, how this astrosesimology applied on uh, variable stars or the pulsation stars based on this uh, example. That is uh, the particular star I selected here is SZ link, what I observed. And then uh, finally, uh, the oscillations modes, uh, uh, they are in the SZ link. So, how do you define, how do you uh, determine the oscillation mode of a CZ lane and finally uh, the application of this astrosesimology is to find out the properties of these pulsation stars. So I will just uh, look at these areas in my presentation. So let me go to the next slide. Uh, so if you, uh, we want to get some brief idea about what is astrosesimology, so it is the concept of astrosesimology is uh, a long time back. Actually, it's a kind of uh, a quite uh, new for uh, astronomy. And this is uh, just idea of uh, listen to the stars, listen to the stars rather than looking to the stars. So we can say that is listening to the stars. So why is it? Because this is based on some sort of uh, uh, the pressure waves or the sound waves just created inside the star so that the pressure waves or the sound waves actually just uh, generate some physical changes of the stars basically it's a change of uh, magnitude or the brightness so however by looking at this uh, magnitude of the brightness variations in carefully we can investigate the uh, inside the stars so that's why we call this is uh, rather than looking to the stars, we call this is listening to the stars. Uh, now we know the astrosesimology is a real music of spheres because uh, the spheres actually just make these uh, oscillations or the sound waves inside that and these sound waves create some changes, uh, surface changes of the stars. So once you look at the sur these surface changes, so we can analyze in detail about the internal structure of the star. So that is the astrosesimology. Uh, so this is the only way to probe the inside the star, right? So there are different pulsation modes penetrated in different depths inside the star. Therefore, we can investigate the different depths of these uh, stars. So that is another important uh, advantage of this astrosesimology. So all the way from the surface to the core, if you want to look at in detail, this is the only way to study. Astrosesimology provides a tool to find the internal structure of the star. The pulsation frequencies give information about the density profiles, temperature profiles, uh, region where we uh, uh, just looking at it in detail where there is no way of no other way of studying about this internal structure. So that is the idea about this astrosesimology. 
Okay, so uh, here, uh, the brief introduction about this, how it's going on here. If you look at the interior of the star, so these are the, the pressure waves or the sound waves, right? Just move in different layers on different depths inside the star. These are the standing wave patterns created. So if you look at this uh, blue line, so that standing wave or the, the pressure or the, the sound wave travels through the center of the star. But if you look at this uh, red uh, standing wave, sound wave, it just uh, move within the surface or close to the surface, the star. So if you detect these frequencies of these oscillations, you can determine the different depths of the star. You can determine the properties or you can determine the internal structure uh, within the star. So you can actually see here, uh, uh, these, uh, these vibrations or the standing wave patterns create different uh, uh, the surface uh, brightnesses. So uh, in the color here, this is maybe a contraction, this is maybe a expansion. So therefore, in one part is uh, in uh, compression and another part of the star might be expansion. So, so therefore, there's a some sort of a combination of expansion and contraction along the surface will give a very uh, good idea, a good tool to analyze the star inside the star. Okay. Right. So here, uh, so that is basically about what we call astrosismology. And uh, here, uh, I will apply this tool, the astrosismology to particular type of star because we have a, a set of variable stars intrinsic and extrinsic so i'm just looking at this part only intrinsic variable stars so from the intrinsic variable stars uh, there are a lot of other type of intrinsic variables like rr library beta shafits supernovas so among those i just select this delta scuti type stars only uh, there's a one reason that these delta scutis type stars are very short period variables uh, which we can actually uh, get the variation within one day. So in the observational constraints, so it is very easy to get few cycles within one night. If you look at the RR Lyrae, so the variation or the periodic variations are more than one day, uh, the periods. So therefore, uh, if you want to observe a few cycles, you have to continuously looking at it uh, uh, for a few nights of observation or if you uh, have to get uh, a, a very big data set to get some idea. So that is the one advantage of just going for Delta Scuti stars. So then I just uh, pick this Delta Scuti stars uh, for my study. So I'll uh, just uh, uh, show uh, where are these uh, type, different type of variable stars in the HR diagram. So if you look at, uh, now this is the main sequence, right? And uh, there are the most stars actually lie on the main sequence uh, before they actually just end up their life cycle. So some of these main sequence stars just uh, move it to the other areas. Uh, so most of the stars actually move it from the main sequence, so they become, uh, most of them sometimes become variable. Of course, if they become a red giant, that is a variable because they are not going to be uh, same as uh, earlier at the main sequence. So here, when they just move it from the main sequence, so they will start uh, changing their brightness. So it's quite uh, often they are variable. So the delta scuti stars are in this area. This is called the instability strip. So just uh, above this main sequence, just after the main sequence, they just move into the, this area, what you call the delta scuti stars. So the RR Lyrae is somewhere here. Then the, the, the Sheffield sign this uh, instability strip. And here the supergiants and the beta Sheffields are uh, very big uh, stars, huge stars, somewhere here in the uh, HR diagram. So I'm just focusing on this area, uh, what we call the Delta Scuti stars. Okay. 
So uh, then, uh, these, uh, this is a some sort of overview of all the variable stars, right? If you look at uh, different variable stars, R or Live, Delta, Scuti, Beta, Shepix, uh, this is a rough uh, estimation about the periods. R or Live, it's a quite big uh, uh, periodic stars. Uh, the periods are uh, more than one day. Delta Scuti, look at that. So it is one to three hours. Or oh, it's very small period, periodic change. So to just uh, quickly uh, changing stars, right? And they are mostly population one stars, right? Delta Scuti quite new, uh, more uh, metal abundance, heavy element abundance is there in Delta Scuti. And Delta Scuti and the Beta Shepids, both of them shows radial and non-radial pulsations. So uh, let me show you in the next few slides what are radial and non-radial pulsations. So this is the uh, just a general idea about all the stars, uh, variable stars, pulsating stars. Okay, so here the delta scuti. Furthermore, I just uh, move it uh, some uh, parameters of delta scuti stars. They are population one, high metal city, uh, relatively young stars. Uh, the mass uh, range is uh, 1.5 to 2.5 solar masses. That is the typical range of uh, delta scuti uh, stars. High amplitude variation. I mean, the variation of uh, the magnitude variation is uh, uh, very much. It's uh, in the magnitude scale. Some of these stars, 0.3 magnitudes. So it's very uh, easy to identify uh, these magnitude variation with a small telescope. And the pulsation period is less than one day. The rotation, uh, typically it's uh, slow rotators. Uh, it's a 30 meters per second uh, rotation period, V sine I, right? And uh, they are in the central hydrogen O shell hydrogen burning. This is very important. Central hydrogen O uh, shell hydrogen burning. They are just leaving from the main sequence. So the core uh, hydrogen is almost uh, finished. So they are moving to the shell hydrogen burning state. That's why it's very important to study about these particular type of stars. Uh, then they have convective core. So with this, uh, we can actually uh, see that how important is studying about these delta scuti type stars. Okay. So now this is uh, about the 3D oscillation, uh, uh, how it happens inside the star very briefly. Radial oscillations. Now these pulsations, uh, sometimes it makes mostly it makes a uh, standing wave patterns. So if you look at a standing wave, this is the the uh, when you make a standing wave, always uh, the center is a node and the surface is an anti node. So therefore, this is the the, the most basic standing wave pattern and then you can see the next standing wave pattern there's a one uh, shell uh, the layer uh, where there is a one possibility of making another node uh, uh, this is definitely anti node so these are uh, radi uh, radial standing wave patterns but if you look at this right this diagram they, they are uh, non radial standing wave patterns so therefore, we have a radial and non-radial oscillations. So if you look at these two characteristics, stars actually oscillate in radial and non-radial both oscillation modes. Now, when we define these oscillations, we need three numbers. They are very important, like quantum numbers. So we call this steer, uh, quantum numbers. Uh, N is the number of radial modes. L is the degree of the mode, that means L is just to define the non-radial oscillations, M is also to define the non-radial oscillations. So I cannot actually go in detail about these things within this limited time, but remember N is the radial modes, L and M are the non-radial uh, oscillation modes. So uh, here, so this is uh, the idea about the non-radial oscillations. So if you always look at L equals 1, that means that is the start of non-radial oscillations, non-radial components. 
So L equals one, M equals zero. Then there are a lot of combination like L equals one, M equals one like that. So you can see the star oscillates in a very complex manner with these combinations. So that's what we are looking for. So first of all, when we looking about the astrosismology, we have to determine these oscillation modes N L M. So uh, even the mode, whether it is L equals one or L equals two mode. Right, so that is very uh, difficult uh, in the first case. So that's what uh, we are supposed to do here. So this is a, a radial oscillation and this is an unradial oscillation. So it is not symmetric, right? Here, and this is the light curve. Now we have only a one tool, right? We have only a one way of determining all these oscillation mode. That is a light curve. So if you look at the pulsation uh, light curve of a pulsation star, so the light curve is sometimes very simple, sometimes it's very complex. Now even if you look at this light curve, this is uh, you can see a very uh, common, uh, very prominent uh, oscillation here. Of course, that is a main oscillation, but when you look at carefully, there are some slight uh, bounce off from the light curve. So that means within the main oscillation, there are some small oscillations as well. This is the main oscillation. Within that main oscillation, there's another oscillation going on under that. So therefore, if you look at this light curve, there are some other bumps also, some other characteristics you can find out. First of all, we have to find out how many frequencies are there within this light curve. So in order to do that, we have to go for the frequency analysis of the light curve. So there are different techniques we can apply Fourier transformation is possible most common long scalar periodograms we can calculate structure function analysis or maybe uh, force uh, phase dispersion minimization techniques can be applied so here uh, i did my observation uh, of this particular star called SZ lane that is a delta security type stars I did my observation using uh, Mount Abu Observatory in India. So let me thank about uh, uh, about the facility from India. So I used this uh, telescope in Mount Abu Observatory, 50 centimeter CDK telescope. This is a very handy telescope uh, with all the facilities, uh, which is uh, equipped with the uh, UV VRI filter wheel and then the CCD, uh, EMC CD. So this is a, a very handy telescope to observe uh, this particular type of stars, short period stars, because we can actually uh, observe throughout the day without any uh, interference. Uh, this is a robotic telescope even we can actually observe, uh, we can operate it from uh, main campus uh, PRL. So I use this uh, facility for my observation. Right, so this is the light curve, which we uh, part of a light curve I actually obtained from the uh, Mount Abu Observatory. Right, so this is the first uh, is uh, the, this is the observation of Mount Abu Observatory. Uh, I just compare this observation with the another uh, facility. This is called Wide Angle Searching for Planets, uh, VASP project. Uh, uh, this project is actually going on to investigate uh, exoplanet systems but this uh, project also observed the z link so i just got that data set as well and there are some data available uh, in abvs source site as well so i just got uh, this z link uh, from the abvs source well. but when you look at these three observations now we sampled our data set uh, within three seconds so that means UBVRI observation was done uh, within three seconds. I mean, we have a very high time resolution photometry. But uh, if you look at the VASP, that is a one mi uh, minute resolution. So, ABV is so four minute resolution. You can see how important is our light curve. So, you can see this is very detailed. So, it's a very high resolution light curve, temporal resolution. So, we can actually use this one to detect all the frequencies, even a very short uh, high frequencies within this light curve. 
Right, so this is the part of a light curve and uh, in uh, BVR bands, you can see the BVR bands I put it together and uh, here I just normalize uh, to the maximum point. So uh, here, of course, by just looking at the even uh, without just analyzing the uh, light curve, I can actually see some other frequencies available. Here are the other variations. Of course, there's a uh, main variation, main period frequency F0, and there are some other variations like F1, F2. So let me show you the results of the frequency determination of using these light curves. Uh, so uh, that means we have, uh, when you just look at uh, the light curve in detail, when you do the Fourier decomposition of the light curve, so this is the main light curve, so you can see the same shape, and when you decompose it to find out the frequencies of the, within the light curve, you can see uh, the main period, main frequency in red, and there are some other frequencies in green and the blue as well as some other minor frequencies also they are in this light curve. So this is the Fourier decomposition of the light curve of the mean. So let me show you uh, the next slide, the results of this. Okay, now uh, when you do the, uh, the, the frequency analysis using DFT, uh, Fourier transformation, or uh, I rather use Lomskagel LS method, Lomskagel periodic analysis. So this is the periodograms. Periodograms. So this is the periodogram of the SZ lane light curve. Uh, we can see clearly here the one frequency is exactly it's there. This is the uh, most prominent frequency uh, we observed it. Uh, of course, this is very small, but that is 8.296 cycles per day. This is the prominent, the most uh, prominent frequency in that light curve. So then after that, uh, we detect another uh, frequency that is uh, 16.59 cycles per day. And then furthermore, we have more frequencies in the light curve. This is the Mount Tabu data. This is another observation I uh, contributed uh, with the ATP telescope in Arizona. So that telescope also observed the same uh, target as is link. So here with, with that data also, we can see the same frequencies we can determine 8.296, 16.259 and then 24.89. So the same frequencies will get it from uh, other sources also. That means this star has uh, different frequencies uh, in, in its light curve. So uh, this is another important thing I wanted to show that actually uh, so since uh, this presentation it's uh, just run it on some other way uh, we have to eliminate now this is the first frequency that means the most prominent frequency in order to observe the other frequencies very clearly, we have to eliminate this main frequency, what we call the whitening. So I I just uh, did the whitening of the first frequency. So then I look at the next frequencies because if you don't do this whitening process, because the, the dominant frequency will affect the other frequency, and you don't get this the other frequencies very clearly. You don't detect it very very clearly. So therefore, the whitening process is important. So I just did the whitening of this 8.296 uh, uh, frequency and then only you can determine, you can clearly see the others are actually come up in the light uh, periodic run. So the whitening process is very really important. Okay. So after all these analysis, uh, so I just move it to this. This is another way of uh, removing the harmonics. So if you have uh, the main period, so you can actually uh, determine the main period and remove it from that. So then you can look at it, uh, the rest of the frequencies within the uh, residual light curve, right? So these uh, process is very important because otherwise you cannot determine 
uh, the hidden frequencies, very weak frequencies within the light curve. So it is very important, this analysis process. So after all this, now this is uh, actually these two frequencies are frequency aliasing, artificial frequencies. In order to remove this, we have to do the whitening process. So after all this, I determine the pulsation frequencies of acetylene and then I figure it out. There are uh, exactly there are nine frequencies we determine from the Mount Tabu data and the bus uh, project. We can determine up to five frequencies because you know the time resolution is very low and ABV is also determined uh, up to five or six frequencies. But I determine uh, up to nine frequencies from Mount Tabu data. So these are the frequencies uh, which I determine the power spectrum of the uh, frequencies. So first of all, we have to determine the frequencies of the uh, uh, pulsation star. Then we have to analyze uh, what is the mode of these frequencies, whether these frequencies are radial or non-radial. And if it is a non-radial, what is the mode, whether it is L equals 1 or L equals 2. For that, we have to go for another detail analysis uh, that is called the uh, uh, oscillation modes, right? Determine the oscillation modes. So, in that case, we have to determine uh, the amplitude of these oscillations. Now, you can see the main frequency, the amplitude of the main frequencies are main frequencies this. For uh, B band, this is the amplitude. For B band, the amplitude and the R band. Now they are not same, right? They are not same. So if you look at the first frequency, that means uh, the frequency of this, uh, frequency of this, uh, 8.297, this is the main frequency. That frequency, uh, the amplitude of that frequency in the B band is 0.7 and B band is 0.5, R band is 0.4. So they are different. We have to determine uh, these amplitudes later on. So once you get the amplitude of these frequencies, these are the amplitude for uh, first frequency and the second frequency, third frequency, we get the amplitudes and the phases of these frequencies. Then we have to determine the amplitude ratios, right? Amplitude ratios of the B band, amplitude ratios of the B band and the R band. So once you get the amplitude ratios, then only we can determine the modes of these oscillations. So therefore, we have to go for uh, in a very detailed analysis of theoretical modeling. Now we have to model uh, these amplitudes artificially, theoretically. So in that sense, we have to go for very detailed analysis of theoretical analysis. I don't want to actually show all these stuff uh, in this uh, short presentation. But you can find out uh, this uh, theoretical amplitude uh, uh, determination from the uh, literature. So once you do the theoretical amplitude calculation, then you can uh, you can compare with the observation. Now, in the theoretical modeling, right? Theoretical modeling is the most complex part of this uh, research because it depends on so many factors, temperature, gravity, mass, metal abundance, all these have to take into account, right? Because all these factors determine the theoretical amplitude of these oscillations. So therefore, all these are the inputs to determine the theoretical amplitude. So we have to input to our model all these variations and then see whether these theoretical amplitudes are matched with the observed amplitudes. So if it is not converging, we have to go back and then we have to change again the parameters and then see whether this is our approaching to our observations. So this process is very complex. You have to do it again and again, very time consuming process. So however, when you do this, finally, we can have some sort of a, a results, uh, acceptable results with the 
desired temperature, gravity and mass parameters. So then once you do this thing, not only you are converging to the observation but also you are determining the parameters of your star. Of course, let's say you are not certain about the parameters of the acid link, that is which I actually use it here. You start with a, some sort of a, uh, average or maybe a, some uh, uh, initial values, but you can uh, converge your parameters, stellar parameters to a quite accurate values within this process. That is another advantage of this. So let me show you. Uh, these are the amplitude ratios you compare with the uh, observation. These dots are the observations in the three bands, B, V, R bands. These are the observations. These are the theoretical lines. See that this line is L equals 0. This is L equals 1, L equals 2. So you have, you can change uh, the modes in the theoretical analysis. L equals 1, L equals 2, L equals 3 and see whether your observation will fall on these areas, whether it is fall on L equals 0, L equals 1, or L equals 2. So therefore, then you have a method to clearly say my frequency, the oscillation is exactly equals L equals 0 mode or L equals 1 mode. So this is the, uh, the method. So then I will show my results later on. Now this is my observation. So uh, the results of acid limb. So I observed two frequencies. Actually, I did for only two frequencies because you know that uh, the other frequencies are very small. It's very difficult to determine the amplitudes. So these three frequencies, I can determine the amplitudes. So uh, the frequency of 8.297 and the frequency of 16.59. And I did two models. I did my uh, theoretical analysis based on two models. That is, one is uh, mass is 0.2 uh, mass, solar mass, temperature is around this 7522K, log G is 3.77. These are the parameters I used for my theoretical analysis. And I have another model, just a 1.9 solar mass and slightly a higher temperature of 7557 7, and log G is 3.86. So you can see the blue line is this model. And the red line is this model. So therefore, these frequencies I can match with these models as well as with the uh, and, uh, all, uh, uh, all modes of the oscillations. So here, the blue line is more close to the observation. Of course, I did uh, chi-square analysis, chi-square chi minimization. Otherwise, it is very difficult to say that. But when you do the chi-square minimization of these three observations with the theoretical line, you can say that which one is close part. So here, uh, I can uh, say here in this case, my this model is more appropriate. Therefore, I finally determine the temperature of acid lane as 7557 and log G is 3.86 days. So that is my conclusion of the physical parameters and of course the mode of the oscillation is L equals 0. So L equals 0 because this is very close to L equals 0. The continuous line is L equals 0. So therefore these oscillations are radial oscillations. They are not non-radial oscillations. So finally uh, of course, uh, we can further uh, study about the mass of the uh, star. Uh, if you have uh, these uh, uh, evolutionary tracks. So I use the MESA uh, code to produce the evolutionary tracks which is close to my uh, star. So I did the evolutionary tracks for four masses 1.8, 1.85, 1.9, 1.95 and 2. So these are the evolutionary tracks uh, which is close to my star and even that evolutionary tracks actually shows that these are the two models which I use it. This model is two, uh, uh, two mass star and this model is 1.9 mass star. However, evolutionary tracks fall some little off from that. However, uh, maybe if we can say that this one is uh, very close uh, to that and this one is the close one from my uh, observation. So therefore, the, the mass of the SZ link would be 
something like 1.9 solar mass star. So, uh, I mean, this is a very long process, a very complex process. So you have to go again and again, uh, the analysis, theoretical analysis, you can modify the theoretical uh, input parameters and however, you have to uh, come closer to the observation uh, to get the physical parameters of the star as well as you can determine the oscillation modes uh, with this uh, analysis. So that is uh, uh, all about uh, my explanation. Uh, so uh, I hope that uh, you might get some idea about uh, stress technology and the applications of spinning which is very important determining the stellar parameters. Thank you very much.